Okay, uh, hello everyone. For, welcome to another meeting of our Rocky Mountain Map Society. We actually even have new members here that we're going to enroll later on. And uh, we have good participation out there in uh, Zoom land. We are here at beautiful History Colorado. I wish that all of you out there in remote world would, could be here because we're going to have a lot of the maps right here and we're going to have a celebration, some drinks and things like that. So but you'll get to hear uh, uh, some of what's going to be happening today. Today we have our favorite, my, my favorite maps event. This is one of our uh, most liked events during the year because it's time now for members to actually get to talk and to show the maps that they enjoy and they love. So this is a, a great opportunity to, to share our passion for maps. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. We have several speakers. They're going to go, it's going to go fast. Each one of you has five minutes to show off and talk about your favorite map. I know it's hard to do, but um, it's an elevator pitch here. So We're gonna have Sean come up, I think, Sean Boyd, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about the History Colorado Map Collection. Give me the mic. Yes. Okay, so that's you, Sean. Just speak okay. close to that. You got that? I will talk into both. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm Sean Boyd. I'm the curator of archives here at History Colorado. So welcome. Many of you have been here before. Um, so I take care of the books, manuscripts, maps, newspapers, microfilm, all the flat stuff is kind of my area. Um, and I picked four maps as my favorite map. Um, number one being the e Ebert Gilpin map of 1862. Unfortunately, I did not put up digital copies. Sorry, online folks. They are all cataloged and digitized in our catalogs. So you can, you can find them. So I have the Ebert map I have, which was the first map produced in Colorado after by a native Colorado or by a person from Colorado um, in 1862. Apparently it was better than the post, the USGS equivalent maps of the time. Um, I also brought a survey map from the guide to the Kansas gold mines in, at Pikes Peak from the notes of Captain G.W. Gunnison. Um, oh, Wes is gonna hold the maps up. That makes me super nervous, but he's gonna hold them up. <laughs> yeah. He's my Vanna. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. And and hold it toward the camera so they can see it. That's the that's the Ebert map. Thank you, Bill. Yep. And then and then I have the map of Kansas yeah. with routes from the from Kansas City to the uh, gold gold mines. And I love that map. It's a copy because the original is still in the back of the book. It's one of those fragile little back of the book guides. Um, I love it because it wants you to buy, and here comes Wes with my stuff, it wants you to buy all your stuff in Kansas City to come out here to the gold mines, and it um, that's not the best route to get here. If you're coming from the east, you would want to start in Omaha, not in Kansas City. So I love that as a at maps as political and um, commercial tools. And then the other two maps I brought are just, you can just bring one of them. Um, are both from the 1700s and they show uh, kind of the unknown of the West and how they didn't really know what they were talking about. <laughs> um, one of them, the one West springing up uh, actually talks about parts unknown and it has California as an island. Um, so yeah, West can be our Vanna and or auctioneer. Um, both of those maps are from the James Willard collection. He was one of the founders of CU Boulder's um, archives, but he was on our board first. So he gave us his map collection of the Western hemisphere. So there's a number of really interesting maps in there that Wes sat down with me and helped me make sure that the descriptions were correct. So that is my five minutes. I don't know who's next. Should I just go down? Okay. There. We just, just get it in the middle. Oh, so Chris. We got Chris Theory from Colorado School of Mines. I hope I have this. Really you good. don't have any maps? Or... Well, the, the image is there. Okay, there, so there. Here, just go to the image. Okay. There we go. Hi. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Theory. I'm the map and GIS librarian out at the Colorado School of Mines in Golden. Uh, before I talk about my map, I just want to invite all of you. I know many of you have come to see me at times. Please come and see me. I will show you all the wonderful treasures we have in our map room. We currently have a scavenger hunt going on. You can win a 15-minute topo of Colorado. It's a big, big draw. 
Uh, so we have 165,000 maps and 166,000 air photos of Colorado, some that date back to the early 30s. Uh, the collection is, uh, the library is open to the general public. All of our stuff checks out just like books and can go out through interlibrary loan. Uh, my favorite map that I brought, uh, here's the image of, and I did bring it here in person, is by a man named Edward Sieben. Uh, it is the, uh, the image here and the map is the original pen and ink. Uh, Edward Sieben was a um, mining engineer who lived in Denver over 100 years ago. He uh, worked in the in the West here, starting in the late 1880s to the uh, about 1910. And he was one of those guys, as my, my colleague said, he was a frustrated artist trapped in the life of a mining engineer. And you can see, if you've seen mine uh, maps before, most mine claim maps, they're just those boxes that kind of overlay himself. You see a lot of those on bar walls. And that's how he was, he was, uh, uh, contracted to do but he drew this thing and all the trees have shadows and again i don't know what his motivation was but there's 30 43 known maps we have 42 of them in, uh, by him we have 42 in our collection and the majority of them this is the prettiest one i think the majority of them had this artistic flair to them and now Sieben was an interesting man i've done as much research as probably possible although i gotta dig a little more at DPL, um, he was just an ordinary guy. But if you look at photographs from the late 1800s, where, you know, those pictures and they like name, there's Horace Tabor, here's the governor, and then there's 20 other people. He's one of those 20 people. He's always in those photographs. And I found all these things where he's interwoven with the higher echelon of Denver society. I'm wondering, how did this come about? And the answer is he did it the old fashioned way. He married a rich guy's daughter. <laughs> so uh, he, he, you know, he was, he was after that, he was involved with all sorts of shenanigans everywhere, uh, being the treasurer of a company that made uh, deluxe railroad cars. They never built a railroad car or a pineapple farm in Hawaii where they never had pineapples. Uh, things like that. He was indicted and 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 made the the New York Times with this indictment, and it it was great fun. But anyway, Stephen made these maps. Uh, I couldn't tell you if he just did them because he doodled on the way home from his assignment, or he purposely did them with some artistic flair. Uh, my information about him is is really limited. I I did find. I probably have one minute left. But I was doing the family history, trying to find, see if uh, I could find out anything about his family to see, hey, do you have information about him? You know, do the genealogy. I reached this dead end. And I found one name. He had one son, this is a long story. Um, who, long, one son who turned into an alcoholic, so much so he got divorced 100 years ago. So getting divorced in the 1920s was a big, big deal. And then I lost trace of everything. And I wrote this one family saying, I think you're related to this guy. I'd love to talk to you about it. Got a five years later, they call me and say, hey, my brother and I are in town. Come out and see you. And I thought it'd be two old guys. No, two young guys come in, they're talking and they were just hysterical. And I told them about that. You're always hesitant to tell people about their dark side of somebody's family. And they were like blown away. They were so happy to learn that there was a black sheep in the family and that they only learned that this guy existed because on their grandmother's deathbed, she confessed that she had been married before to this other guy. And wonderful story. Anyway, I wish I knew more about that. Was his son? He was he was a stand up guy, but his son was kind of a schnook. So um, this is the backstories behind the maps are the most fun. I mean, it's interesting to look at, but it's the backstories that make it great. I will pass it on. Okay, hello, I'm Patrick McGranahan, and I am a land surveyor here in Colorado, and I also like to make maps for fun. And let's see, oops. So I already moved to the slide, but this is a map that I created, and this is the route of Denver to Santa Fe in the style of John Ogilvy. And I know it's kind of weird. I know this is our favorite map, and this is a map I created, but uh, a couple of people asked me to present about this, and uh, I think it's something that like uh, a lot of us map people can uh, enjoy. Um, so, uh, so 
let me talk a little bit about John Ogilvy. There we go. Um, so John Ogilvy, he was a he was a man who wore many different hats. He was a Scottish guy, and uh, he fought in the Thirty Years' War. He actually saw some action there, became a prisoner of war. Coming back to England, he was shipwrecked and kind of had a whole. There's a whole catastrophe. Uh, he lived through the the Great Fire of 1666. Uh, he lost his house, and he was actually part of uh, part of the survey to kind of establish boundaries after uh, after the fire. And he he's also he was like a dance instructor. He opened theaters and operas. He he was uh, he kind of organ he helped organize the the coronation of the restoration of uh, the monarchy of Charles II. Anyways, I could go on and on about him, but what what's really uh, kind of what he's known for, at least in the map world, is his Atlas Britannica. And um, this is an atlas of about 200 pages, and it was strip maps that showed the road between different uh, cities in England or in the United Kingdom. Um, and this was, you can kind of imagine 17th century uh, England. It was uh, it was kind of rough. I mean, the 17th century is a rough time in Europe. There was the 30 years war, there was the civil war and Cromwell, and there was a lot going on. Uh, There's a war with the Dutch. Anyways, uh, these maps were kind of like, they really capture a moment in time. Uh, they have different manors, uh, churches, buildings, um, uh, forests. It's kind of a, it's a snapshot of England at that time. Um, I'm trying, I'm probably talking really fast. I just want to be on time. So anyways, I like to make maps. Usually this is a kind of a Sunday morning thing. One Sunday morning, I was just kind of browsing the internet and I found this website, KM Alexander, and he has all these like uh, brushes and kind of tools to make maps with uh, Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. And I really like, I should give this guy the credit because he really did the heavy lifting. He, you can see all these little uh, features and you can kind of just drop them into your canvas, okay, uh, digitally. And so, and if I would recommend everybody, we're going to post this on YouTube, you can check out the link. If you guys want to make maps, if you have these tools, definitely check out this guy or just Google KM Alexander and Ogilvy. Uh, so I used a software called QGIS. It's like a free GIS software. It's really powerful. It's great software. And I took Interstate 25, split it up into about five different uh, sections. And uh, and kind of you can kind of see how there's boxes around each section. So I took those boxes and dropped them into Illustrator. And then I kind of just traced each section and added names of uh, towns um, and different features, rivers, buildings, um, and kind of just wanted to give it a flavor. Um, here's another slide. Um, yeah, so you can kind of see in like, it, part of the difficulty was, uh, it's not really a straight line from Denver to Santa Fe, especially in the, the Southern part, it really hooks over. So you can see how the compass is kind of turns. Um, the border between Colorado and New Mexico is kind of at an angle. And I think, yeah, that's kind of, I, I'm running out of time. So that's kind of the talk, but if anybody has any questions or anything later, um, I think we're having a social event. So, so let's talk later. Thank you. Hi everyone. My name is Cynthia Jennings. I'm a graduate student in the GIS and geoinformatics program at School of Mines and Today, I will be talking about a topological map. Uh, topology, not to be confused with topography, is a field of mathematics, but it's also defined as the way in which the constituent parts of something, anything really, are related or arranged. So when you apply that to cartography, a topological map is a type of diagram that's been heavily simplified so that only the vital information remains and any unnecessary detail has been removed. So these maps lack scale. Also, distance and direction are going to be subject to change and distortion. Uh, but the topological relationship between points or features is maintained. So 
Some other examples that we've probably all seen of a topological map are like a subway map or the map of the light rail system. And the only thing that those maps convey are the relationship between stops to one another. If you try and map it onto reality, the points don't line up with where they are um, in space, but the point is to just convey relationships and not spatial characteristics. So on a topological so on a topological map, no matter how much you twist or distort or enlarge or shrink any portion of it or or the entire thing, the arrangement of the features is always going to remain the same. And that's what it's preserving. So this is a topological map of Ecuador and the provinces within it. Uh, the center is the province of Cotopaxi, which you might know because of the volcano. And um, in, it's located in north central Ecuador. So on this map, distinctions in to topography are shown in color rather than by contour lines or symbols on the map. So we'll see that in yellow, areas that are close to the coast that border the Pacific Ocean or islands or lowlands are shown. The lighter yellow is associated with being closer to the coast. It gets darker as you move further inland. The blue relates to the Andes region and the highlands. And as the blue values get darker, that means it's higher in elevation. So Cotopaxi is the darkest. It's from the the tallest mountains in Ecuador. And then finally, red corresponds to the Amazon or the jungle. And so the darker reds are more densely vegetated or forested regions. So another thing to note is that the borders of each province with each other and with other features on the map, whether that be the Pacific Ocean or Colombia or Peru are also preserved. So any border you see with any province on the map is true in real life. The sizes of each province relative with, with to one another are also preserved. So uh, the larger the larger segments or wedges correspond to the larger provinces in real life. But the, the true size are of each province is not to scale, obviously. So topological maps, in essence, are just all about comparison. Uh, each feature retains and gains meaning based off of its association with other features. You can't really look at one in a vacuum uh, because the best way to understand it is in relation to the whole. And my favorite part is the Galapagos, which is just shown as a single circle um, up to the left. And that's because it's defined by the fact that it's surrounded by the coast. And I just think it's a cool way to look at space. And it's one of my favorite maps. Oh, yeah, I totally forgot. Here is a regular map of Ecuador. <laughs> Um, so you can see Cotopaxi sort of up in, up in the middle, and that corresponds with the center. You see Peru. So it, it sort of corresponds, but not quite, and you have to think about it, and I like that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dennis McCarthy. I uh, moved to Denver two years ago. In Boston, from Boston, where I was a volunteer at the Leventhal Map Center. And since moving here, I've been volunteering at the Denver Public Library working for Craig Haggett. You may have seen the uh, time, travelers, time Travelers Map of Boston. That's something I created for the library. Uh, so we're going to look at, do, 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 there we go, this map. This is the first, the earliest extant town plan to be published within the present boundaries of the United States. It was first printed in 1722. It had nine revisions over time. The last one was published in 1769. Um, the, uh, this was drawn and sold by Captain John Bonner, born in 1643 in Cambridge, Massachusetts, died in 1726. He uh, was a captain, navigator, map seller, and shipwright. The map was engraved on copper plate and printed by Francis Dewing, uh, Dewing arrived in Boston from London in 1716 and in 1717 he engraved the first map to be printed in this country from a copper plate. The original is 16 inches tall and 23 inches wide. The scale is about 500 feet to the inch. Uh, this is sort of, you know, looks, this is a, one, one description of it said it's simple, well composed, uncluttered and attractive. So it, it's sort of clean, more, more 20th century than 18th century. Uh, Boston is here is occupying the Shawmut Peninsula. 
the uh, irregular peninsula connected to the mainland by this narrow strip of land called the Neck. Now you may, if you've been to Boston or seen a map of Boston, you may have trouble figuring out how does this relate? So here is this map overlaid on a current map of Boston. The, um, the long wharf, the big wharf that sticks out here is pointing east out into the Atlantic Ocean. Now the, uh, as the, you can see on the lower left here, we've got an index. The capital letters are for meeting houses, what we call churches today. The lower case letters are for um, secular buildings. And uh, then there is a list of over here, great fires in Boston, and then the, the years of the smallpox epidemics. The map itself uh, has is unusual. It has, well, here's the uh, the lower, the close up of what I was just talking about. And then at the bottom here, it says the printed and engraved by Francis Dare uh, doing. Um, the map itself has, goes down to the individual property and it doesn't have a footprint of buildings. It has the facade of a building as if you had tipped the building over on its back and it was facing up. Uh, the, most of them are drawn, you know, pretty much cookie cutter, but the important buildings like uh, here, that's um, the old state house still extant. And here is the first church meeting house there. He, he does a little bit more, but obviously he's not an architectural draftsman. You know, he's more of a uh, seaman, which you can see if you look along the coast here, he's very much better at drawing ships than buildings. Uh, he's also get pretty bad on topography. Uh, this, this, the Boston has three major hills. Uh, Fort Hill here, Copps Hill to the north, and um, the Tri Mountain to the west, but you can't really see them much here. There's Fort Hill, Copps Hill's not there. Um, Beacon Hill, the center of the Tri Mountain is sort of vague. Yes, two minutes, thank you. Uh, the, the map was, uh, the second version of the map introduces William Price. It says it's sold by John Bonner and William Price. Uh, and then after Bonner died, Price did all the later revisions. The major one was in 1633. 1628, a different map of Boston was produced in a big cartouche and lots of text. And William Price seemed to think that he had to do the same thing. So this is the fifth state of the map. Um, and as you can see, he put this cartouche here, text in that, historical text up here uh, about Boston and advertisements for what he sells at his shop down here. So it's a much busier looking map. And he also added more to here. There's another column that are, where they're putting more of the, uh, the new um, buildings in there. So that's sort of what I wanted to say, except at the end. So from a cartographic perspective, it's sort of simple. You know, it's, you know the cartouche is simple. The drawing is quite simple, excuse me, stop that. Uh, but from a historic perspective, this is invaluable. So this is showing you how Boston physically developed from 1622 to 17, from 1722 to 1769. The buildings, the streets, how you know where the where the new things were being built and where the land was being made. So that's it. Thank you very much. Naomi, we got our program director. Hello, I brought the map that we're going to look at. It's on the back table um, from my library. So um, I'm just going to, where's Chris? You're sitting right here. <laughs> so weirdly, our talks are very similar. Um, we're both obsessed with a couple old map makers from the same period who are very artistic. You can't hear it. Yeah. Okay, better. Yeah. Um, the other funny thing I'm going to say is that our collection is bigger. So... <laughs> <laughs> So since you started it, I'm going to um, let everyone know that you can come visit me at the CU Map Library, just like you can visit Chris at his library. And the two libraries have very different strengths and different kinds of collections. So our collection may have more, but it isn't as focused on mining as yours is. In any case, um, we also check out maps. We'll help you do research. You're welcome to come up to Boulder and look at the collection. The map I brought tonight is probably one of our most precious pieces in the collection. We're the only one who has it, I think. So. Let's get going and I'll show it to you. So this is my favorite map. Um, the reason um, why is because it's absolutely beautiful, I think. Um, 
it's something I periodically return to for researching, hoping that there'll be more sources available online if I look again in a couple of years, every time I find something new about it. So um, it's it's the, called the Map of Griffith District. You can read the title here. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, just for context, the Griffith District is named after the brothers David and George Griffith, who discovered gold near the head of Clear Creek during the summer of 1859. This is a very early map. So this became the mining camp of Georgetown, named after George Griffith. So now you know like, where these names came from. So gold, gold was their first goal, but then it soon became clear this is one of the richest silver mining areas in the state. So this map evolved in that period, I think, with the silver mining. So a bit about Major Francis F. Brunet, who is the author of this map. I can show you, you can see his signature down here at the bottom. He, um, this is from his obituary in the Georgetown Courier from March 25th, 1893, and other news accounts. He came to Colorado from Pennsylvania in 1858 and lived first in Fountain City, which is near Pueblo. In 1860, he was running a hotel in Denver and moved to Idaho Springs in 1864. So this is the time about when the map was made. He lived in Georgetown then beginning in 1872 after that. So in his later years, he ended up being a surveyor um, based out of Leadville. So he did a lot of different places in the state as a surveyor. Um, he was a civil engineer and one of the first deputy mineral surveyors for Colorado. There's evidence um, of a mill city, which is now called Dumont, which is near um, Georgetown in this map, um, where there was a claim staked in 1864 by a group that includes F.F. Brunet as one of the um, of 17, I think. So this is a town east of Georgetown. It's not part of this map. So he was really well known um, at the time for surveying this road called the Georgetown Empire and Middle Park Wagon Road or the Berthoud Pass Road. And um, in 1873, the local newspapers did a serialized account of his journeys with friends, which is very funny to read. And I'm happy to pass those along to you. You can find it all in the Colorado Historic Newspapers collection, which is full of information. Um, so they would go on these, these journeys with the friends and then they would write all the details of everything they saw in these newspaper accounts. That was like what people, I guess, found interesting to read at the time. So from a description of wildlife seen along the route in the November, November 4th edition, um, I think this was, no, I'm sorry, I didn't write the newspaper name down. Anyhow, um, I think the Georgetown Courier, thank you. Um, Mr. Brunet um, said the party supped on a 40 pound porcupine and then used the quills for toothpicks. So these are the kind of details that are in these newspaper stories that are a lot of fun. Um, this map is very large. It measures 63 by 22 inches and printed in two pieces. So it's an oversized map. It's extraordinary, extraordinary level of detail, one inches, 400 feet. So the map itself, what you see here covers only about four and a half miles. Um, and is oriented with north to the left so that you can capture this long strip where the Clear Creek actually goes north to south right around Georgetown, whereas, you know, most of it goes east to west. Um, it's my favorite because of this loving care that I feel like Brunet put into the hatchering and the elevation modeling. And even though this is a lithograph, you can still see that it looks sort of like pencil work or brush work. It's really um, beautifully, uh, maybe you can't see it here, you're looking like <laughs> you can't quite see it. Um, when you go to the back, you'll be able to look at this map in person and see the work that went into it. There's also um, lots of little trees, which are each individually hand engraved in the lithograph, which are really pretty too. So I think my theory is that Brunet bothered to do a map like this because he was so familiar with the area, lived there, was well known and was and loved it. And he had investments in the mining industry. So I also wanted to, I didn't bring images of these, but I wanted to say there's not that many maps extant by Brunet. There's a number of general land office plats that he made. He did he did a few um, Georgetown plats when it was first founded, and then he amended those plats. Um, there's one from 1873 you can find in the general land office database. Um, and then he there's also this very famous Theodore Lowe and Brunet map of Clear Creek County from 1866. It's a huge map, like 51 by 72 inches. We have a copy of that. Um, there's one here at Denver Public. I think you might have one of those too. Um, in any case, it contains all that same lovely, very time-consuming shading of the hillsides, which you see in this map. Then there's another map, which is kind of interesting um, because it's part of the Barry Lawrence Ruderman collection. And you can see that online. And it's an actual manuscript map that also has the same type of artwork and cursive handwriting, but Barry does not attribute it to Brunet, although it was from the same time period and also covers Georgetown in the same way that this map does. 
So um, the date of my map, I think, is after 1861. It references the Colorado Territory. You can see that here. You can see it in the signature. Um, but it also includes a separate town of Elizabeth City, which is near Georgetown. It's a little hard to see here, um, which was platted in 1865 and merged with Georgetown in 1866. So that gives you a sense the map was um, around 1865. But um, it might have been produced in 1863 because there's this interesting detail about the Wilson and Cass Gold Mining Company, which I found. Um, they were founded in 1863. That was in Hollister's Mines of Colorado, but I've yet to find any records of the other company, which is the Clear Creek Gold Mining Proprietor. So if anyone knows anything about that, I would love to hear it. Maybe Wes does. Um, one other piece of evidence is interesting. It might date the map to 1864. I don't know if you can see. There's at the very bottom, there's a little lake called Plumbers, and there's Plumbers Ranch on this map too. And J.E. Plummer was the superintendent for the Wilson and Cass Gold Mining Company, um, according to the Rocky Mountain News of August 29th, 1864. So that also helps um, date the map as like an advertising piece for this company when it was founded and also showing plumbers land because he was involved um, in this mining enterprise. So that is my presentation. Next, Vincent Zilagi. Zilagi, okay, let's put it in there. All right, so I'm Vincent Solagi. I'm a board member here at the Rocky Mountain Map Society. So this map, uh, it's actually a really high quality scan from the Library of Congress, but the map itself does such granular detail that it's going to be a little hard to see. But um, I did bring a copy of it in the back as well. So this map is made by Henry Morton Stanley, a name that was super famous for a really long time and then dropped off almost entirely. Uh, we still know him from a couple sort of linguistic relics like the phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume, that's from Henry Morton Stanley, uh, in Darkest Africa, that's from Henry Morton Stanley. And he really made his career as an explorer in Africa, which is quite interesting because he had no formal academic training at all. He was not, uh, in the words of some of his contemporaries, not a proper explorer nor a proper Englishman because he immigrated to the United States. Uh, as a brief tidbit, he's the only man to have served in the Confederate Army, the Union Army, and the Union Navy all within a two-year period. <laughs> That's a much longer story than I can get into in five minutes. But essentially, Henry Morton Stanley, after drifting around for quite some time, finds his career as a journalist. And what he does is, as a sort of roving correspondent for whomever will have him, goes to wherever interesting things are happening in the world, writes about them, and has immediate and tremendous success. His most lasting success is in Africa. He has three major expeditions in Africa. The first one where he finds Dr. Livingston, the second one where he unravels the source of the Nile, and the third one, which is this one, the Amin Pasha Relief Expedition. Um, Amin Pasha was a really weird guy. He was a German Jew who went into the service of the Ottoman Empire, converted to Islam, goes to, and is somehow given a post in Central Africa in a place called Equatoria, basically modern-day Uganda. Um, he was basically destined to die unremarkable. He was about four foot 11, he could barely see and did not speak really any languages that would be useful in this area, but somehow he got this commission. Uh, he ends up becoming very important because even though the Sudan is controlled by an Anglo-Egyptian Ottoman condominium, which is again, a much longer story, uh, there's an Islamist uprising that's called the Modest Rebellion, uh, M-A-H-D-I. And basically imagine sort of like ISIS in the sense of like terroristic, very fundamentalist Islam, no more foreigners, no other religions, that sort of thing. Uh, they actually made a movie about it called Khartoum with Charlton Heston, which some of you may remember. But uh, anyway, Sudan gets overthrown by this modest empire, and then the only one remaining is Amin Pasha. He's, this, he's got 65 soldiers to his name controlling an area about the size of France, and he is useless. He can't do anything, but he is able to send letters out. And for some reason, one of his letters makes it to London and becomes a cause celeb that we need to save Amin Pasha. So in comes Henry Morton Stanley. He assembles an expedition of about a thousand men, goes to Zanzibar, and then decides, you know what, that's not the easiest way to do it. I'm going to go all the way around. So just to give you a little bit of perspective, this is the Congo in Central Africa. Zanzibar is in the ocean right over here, and Amin Pasha is up here. So instead of going to Zanzibar and then up here, 
they go to Zanzibar, sail all the way around Africa, up the Congo River, through all of this untracked territory, and then try to rescue Amin. Um, it turns into a debacle, as you can imagine. It splits, the expedition splits into two groups, one headed by Henry Morton Stanley, the other one headed up by the heir to the Jameson Whiskey Fortune. Uh, Stanley eventually makes it, finds Amin Pasha, brings him back to civilization, so-called. Uh, they throw a big gala dinner in his honor in Zanzibar, where the Amin Pasha, who is functionally blind, falls out of a second story window, uh, breaks all sorts of bones, and dies about six months later. <laughs> but he was saved. Uh, <laughs> the rear column, headed up by Jameson, is one of the more tragic stories in African exploration, devolving into what the Victorians might be calling uh, depredations so, what do I say? De depredations so ungentlemanly they shall not be written, which translates into things like slavery, cannibalism, madness, all sorts of things. And that gets suppressed for quite some time because Jameson's family is obviously quite wealthy. Uh, Jameson ends up dying because he tries to shoot uh, a skull. So it, he beheaded somebody, puts the skull on somebody else's head, tries to shoot it off, fails. The gentleman who was about to be shot was unhappy with the endeavor and Jameson ends up dying in some way. But all that is a very long and probably close to my time backstory on why I like this map so much is because History is full of all this sort of stuff, and most people don't get to hear anything about it, let alone the sanitized versions. And why I like this map, and you can see on the physical copy that I have, is this retains all the granular detail, because Stanley was not a professional cartographer. He was not a trained geographer. This is the map that he drew when he got back to civilization about this is where I went, this is what I saw, this is what happened. So there's all sorts of fun little notes, like this lake right here. Uh, it just says, reported by Arabs. He didn't go there. He just said, if somebody told me there was a lake here. And that was good enough for him to put it on the map. Or over here, this route in the little dotted line that you might be able to see, uh, that is paths used by ivory traders. And just all this little granular information that you lose when it, mapping eventually gets done by people like Rand McNally, where the only important things are, these are the roads, these are the towns, maybe a little bit of cross hatching to show elevation gain, that sort of thing. But this long, torturous route is full of hundreds of those kinds of stories. I mean, he this map comes from a two-volume set called In Darkest Africa. It's about 900 pages. Stanley wrote it in 45 days after he got back. He was a very good and very fast writer, if a little fast and loose with facts at the time. Um, so every one of these little stories, and I haven't made my way all the way through In Darkest Africa. I've got about 200 pages to go. But this map is super helpful and was sold with these maps, uh, with the books, so you know, inset maps within them. And you can use it to basically follow along what was going on at each place and in each time. Uh, the last reason I really like this map is my first job out of college was working at the Philadelphia Print Shop West in Cherry Creek North, where uh, our esteemed board member, Chris Lane, had his proprietorship. And he has since retired and sold off his holdings to someone. But uh, this was the last map that I got at the Philadelphia Print Shop West. And I actually didn't even want the map because I didn't know he had it. I just wanted the books. And then there was a little piece of paper in the back that said, comes with maps, which is always a great thing to hear as a map collector. And he threw them in for me. So it's a nice little combination of my professional experience and my academic interest all rolled up into one rather bloody piece of paper. But um, I, just, I could talk about it for 45 more minutes and probably would unless Naomi stops me, which is probably now. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, bud. Great story. And that's it. I think we should do this type of activities more often. They're fascinating, diverse topics, weird characters, um, all sorts of things. Hopefully we can do plan something for uh, next uh, spring. So with that, we're going to go back and take a look at all these maps and enjoy a little bit of uh, spring, so the things that we have. Uh, all of you out there uh, in, in Zoom land, thank you for, for uh, being there. Next time, come down here for this event. It's really uh, very different when you start handling all this material and talking with people passionate about maps. But thank you for being here. It has been recorded so that you can go back and, and, and go over all these different uh, stories that we heard today. So thank you so much, and we'll see you November 9th for our next uh, map. 7th, November 7th, I'm sorry. Tuesday the 7th. See you then. See you then. Thank you.